Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. And back with me again tonight, I think feeling real strong, is Sister Renee Rowland. And we're going to uh, do part three, uh, analyzing the evil sermon that Paul Washer gave titled Examine Yourself. Uh, if you didn't see the first two uh, studies we did on it, uh, they're already uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preachers, so I hope you'll watch this from the beginning. But tonight, I think we're going to be able to complete this study. That's our goal. Sister Renee, say hi to everybody before we get started. Hey, guys. It's good to be back. Yeah, we, we had a nice little trip, and I'm starting to feel more like myself. <laughs> and I appreciate all the well wishes and emails. If you sent me an email in the last couple weeks, Please bear with me. I am really, really, really behind on uh, answering them. And I want to make sure that I, you know, read them fully and send you the answers to your questions. So please be patient with me. And uh, again, we're, we're, we're going to be, Luke brought up a good idea. Whenever Paul Washer brings up a verse, show how he's uh, done, what is it, eisegesis, where he's put his own doctrine into the scripture instead of allowing the scripture to say what it actually says. And uh, we said before in the first uh, study of this, that the very foundation and title of this, examine yourselves, is false. Because Paul is saying, you want to examine me? You want proof of Christ speaking in me? Examine yourselves, prove your own selves. You know, so if you want to confirm me as an apostle, all you have to do is look at yourselves because if Christ is in you, then I am an apostle. So this isn't about examining yourself to see if you're in the faith by if you're living good enough or not to prove you're saved. Paul is telling them to look to their own selves to confirm himself as an apostle. So right there, right off the bat, he's got a wrong understanding of what the verse even means and then goes on to promote this false doctrine uh, throughout it, and you'll see how he cleverly takes bits and pieces of verses, mixes them to make them say something they're not. And that's why Brother Luke had the idea of us stopping whenever there's a verse to actually look at the context to see what it actually says, because he's very sneaky at doing this. And I know the man is very sincere, but sincerity is no substitute for truth. And if an angel from heaven or an apostle preach any other gospel, let him be anathema. Let him be accursed. Those are strong words. And Luke and I stand on contending for uh, the simplicity in Christ. So I'm happy to be back with you guys. Thanks, Brother Luke. Okay. Uh, I want to try a little bit of an experiment in the chat room. Uh, as we're going through this, uh, if anybody has a... Um, a question about the study directed to us, post it in the chat room in all caps, then it'll stand out boldly. And um, Renee and I will be looking for that. So make it all caps, shout it to us. And that way we'll know that you've got a question, but only questions regarding this particular study, please. Okay, so I'm gonna begin reading it and then we'll, uh, we'll uh, show you the error of his interpretation. Okay. Now it goes on. Let's go to another test. Verse 6 of chapter 2. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. The Christian ought to walk as Jesus walked. And you say, Brother Paul, you've gone too far now. Who can walk like Jesus walked? Let me give you an illustration to try to explain to you what I mean. When I was a little boy, my father was a very big man, very smart. And like all little boys, I wanted to be just like him. Now up north, we raised cattle and raised quarter horses. We'd get big uh, snows and my dad would come into my room at five in the morning, even when I was a little boy and say, Paul boy, get up, no rest for the wicked. And when he said, get up, you got up. And we would walk out there in the snow and the one thing I can always remember doing is my father would take those big strides and leave me these footprints in the snow. Now, I wanted to walk like my dad walked. And so I would try to stretch my legs out and put my foot in his footprint. And I would stretch my legs out. Now, you can imagine I was stretching out farther than I could ever go. 
you can imagine I looked ridiculous and you can imagine I fell down. But you will also know by looking at that picture, that the greatest desire in my heart was to walk like he walked. You could tell looking at that little boy, he wanted to be like his dad, even though sometimes he didn't look anything like him. Let me ask you, what's the greatest desire in your heart? Is your greatest desire to walk like he walked? To be like he was? Is that your great desire? Are you seeking to put your foot in his footprints? Listen to me, man. Listen to me, woman. Because if you're not, be afraid. A reporter came up to me one time and said, why are you telling people to be afraid all the time? I said, because they ought to be afraid. Again, this is the test. This is the exam. If I were to look at your life, if I were to film the whole thing, would I see since the supposed day of your conversion, this desire to walk like him? Or do you desire to walk like everybody else? Do you desire to walk like the world and act like the world and talk like the world and fellowship with the world? Do you identify with the world or is it Jesus? Is it Jesus? We're not talking about whether or not you would need to rededicate your life tonight. We're talking about whether or not you need to get saved. Now let's go, go on. The next test, verse 9 of chapter 2. Can we stop that one second? Yeah, I didn't want to gloss over. Let's stop I, I don't right. want to gloss over what he just said. You don't, we're not saying you need to rededicate your life. There's the key right there. He thinks you giving your life to Christ is what's saving you. That's the whole problem. Instead of resting in the fact that Christ gave his life for you, and because of that, you're justified, you're safe. And now because you are, you should be walking in newness of life. But that comes from knowing who you are in Christ not through laws condemning and fear. And every verse he uses is out of context to show that. And he's trying to say that if you don't walk right, it means you're not really saved. And that's garbage. Over here in First Peter, he says, let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. But if you do suffer as a Christian, suffer for Christ's sake, right? He's telling Christians, don't kill people. Don't do evil things. Okay, doesn't he's not saying you're not saved. First Corinthians. But now I've written unto you not to keep company if any man that's called a brother be a fornicator, covetous, or idolater, a drunkard, extortioner, or such a one not to eat. Does he say, uh, say he's not saved? Tell him he's not really saved? No, he's saying break fellowship with him until he straightens up because we don't want to give God a bad name by living like the world. It has nothing to do with salvation. Yeah. And, and, and that little thing about rededicating your life proves to me that he thinks it's about what we're doing for God instead of what God did for us. And, and people love it, Luke. They love it. Oh, he's such a godly man. He does. I don't even know if he's saved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He I, the gospel. As, I, as, I, as I'm trying to read it dramatically as he preached it, uh, I, I hope I can come to tears the way he does because he's so uh, emotional about it. So, yeah, he's putting on a good <laughs> show. He's putting on a real good show. Yep. But I made a, I made a, uh, probably my biggest, most popular video I've ever made is titled Lordship Salvation Liars. Yep. And in that I video, I talk about don't be deceived by a, a preacher's oratory or passion and emotion. It's, 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 is it biblical what he's saying that matters, not how passionate he is? We're but, warned about fair speeches. Fair yes. speeches that exactly. deceive the hearts of the simple. Exactly. And the, his basic premise that he lays out in the very beginning of the sermon, and we talked about in the two previous studies, is based on that verse, examine yourself, and he is misusing it, turning it into heresy. You showed the context of it. It's Paul telling people to, hey, you're questioning my apostleship. You better examine your own uh, self, uh, whether you're really a Christian, because you learned it from me. That's the context, and he's misapplying it. I used to misapply it, but at least it was in a way that was it was uh, not heretical uh, for uh, uh, perverting the gospel. I said, examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. Let's, say, let's ask ourselves, what is 
is our faith. What do we actually believe? Examine what you believe. Are you believing the real gospel? But uh, that I think that's a good thing for us to do. But we do not examine ourselves and test whether we're Christian based upon how uh, well we're living our lives. We all fa have failures. At the, nobody's perfect. So that's doomed to failure. That's doomed to cause nothing but grief and doubt and fear. And that's why he, he's taken away the joy and peace of probably millions of young Christians. Yeah, he even okay. said, everybody's saying, why are you always saying to be afraid? Uh, I'm sorry. I thought he said I came to give life and life more abundantly, that he will give us rest. Whosoever is trusting in him, he'll give us rest and take away that burden. And it's all about him. It's not us looking at ourselves. He, they, they, we, fruits of the spirit are joy, 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 peace, assurance. This is fruits of the spirit. Okay, not this so false religious humility. Yeah. So uh, as I as I'm reading and he, and he's uh, quoting these scriptures, be ready, sister, to uh, re-explain the script the scriptures in context for us. Okay. So I'll continue on, and uh, he says, now the next test, in other words, test yourself. The next test I'm going to give you is verse nine of chapter two. Is this right? I forgot the what even what book he's in. Do you know? Do you remember what book? First John, I think. Okay, first John verse nine of chapter two, he says, the one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now, brother, here is not referring to the poor, even though we ought to love the poor. It's not referring to someone of another race. I always thought that was a, a quite stupid statement anyway, because there's no more than one race, folks. It's called human. Unless you've got a Martian tucked into your pocket somewhere, there's only one race. We're to love people of all different colors and cultures and all that. We know that. But that's not what he's talking about here. When he says, brother, he's talking about believers. If you say that you know God and yet you do not love other believers in a real and practical way and desire fellowship with them, you're lost. Now, let me give you an example. Remember when Jesus said, I was in prison, you did not visit me. I was hungry, you did not feed me. I was naked, you did not clothe me. And guys who do prison ministries will always use that verse saying, we need to go into the prisons. Well, we need to go into prisons, but that verse doesn't really have anything to do with that unless there's Christians in there. What this verse is talking about, and I learned it quite well in Peru and in other third world countries. In some third world countries, my friend, listen to me. You get thrown into jail. You will starve to death unless every day somebody from the outside brings you food. You will. They do not provide food for you. You will die. Now, let's say that someone is thrown in prison for not being an assassin or a thief, but they're thrown in prison in the time of the apostles for being a Christian. They're locked away in there. Now, they're going to die. They're going to starve to death unless somebody else brings them food. Now, that presents a problem because the authorities know anybody that brings this guy food has to be a Christian. And so the one who goes to take him food is in danger of being thrown in prison himself. That's what Jesus is talking about. A love so great that you would risk your own life to care for other brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, listen to me. Do you love to be with people who love to be with and talk about worship and serve God? Or would you rather be with people who have nothing to do with God? Because you are demonstrating what you are. Like I said, I was raised on a farm. You do not see the chickens over there having a good time with the pigs. Chickens hang with chickens. Pigs do their own thing. It's their nature. You say, well, I'm a believer, but man, all, all my friends are, you know, they're, uh, yeah, yeah, I know. They're lost. Do you love other Christians? Well, I know. Uh, I know I, I come to church, big deal. The devil comes to church. 
What do you do when you get here? What do you do outside? Because the church isn't this tent. It's not that building. It's the people. How many Christians are serving you? How many Christians are you reading the Bible with? How many Christians are you praying for? How many Christians are you loving? How many? Brother Luke? Yes. I want to go over that verse he just gave. Okay. And the issue with the foundation here is he's equating this as salvation. But John tells them that this is so their joy may be full. And so they may have fellowship with God and fellowship with one another. And then not to prove they're saved because he's again, he's disputing Gnostic teaching. And he's saying that those that were with us that left us weren't really of us. They were antichrist. They denied something of the gospel. They denied his bodily resurrection. They denied he was the son of God. They denied something. And now they're talking about hating one another, brothers and sisters. And so he wants to reconcile this confusion and stuff going on in the fellowship of these Israelite believers hating one another and saying, you know, you, you can't say that you love God and hate part of his body. So this is about fellowship. And then he confirms over here uh, in first John. Um, I'm sorry. First John two, hold on. Uh, which is what he's saying. First John two, nine, but I'd like to show here. This is not trying to prove you're saved because you love people. He's saying, uh, if, if you're not in proper fellowship and then he said if you're saying you're in the light and hate your brother uh, you're in darkness he that loves his brother abides in the light and there's none occasion of stumbling in him you see so their joy may be full you won't stumble if you're abiding in the light and loving one another okay if you're in darkness you tend to stumble he's not saying that you're not saved and then he says I write unto you little children saved people luke little children because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake period mm -hmm. he, he's saying and because you do know him the word of god is strong in you and you have overcome the wicked one and he's confirming who they are in christ it's not saying you're not saved if you're not doing it He's saying that you will stumble if you don't. You won't have joy and fullness of fellowship with one another and with God. So his very premise of saying that these are standards for salvation is wrong. It's completely wrong. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the... Uh, as I was reading that, I was thinking about Renee and Celine and RL and Sarah Jane and even myself. And I'm, I'm thinking, how does that, how would we answer all his questions? Uh, well, first of all, that's not what examine yourself and the test that Paul's talking about. That's, that's not even the, the same context or subject. But if we, even if we used it according to Paul Washer, uh, I have no doubt that everybody here loves to be with Christians. We prefer to be with, with believers. We want to talk about Jesus all the time and the Bible all the time. I mean, well, God, uh, every night we have some kind of a live program. Everybody's anxious to participate. And I know that we want to, to help each other and love each other. We, we will pass this test. But guess what? I don't have to pass his test because salvation is not determined by how well we're growing, maturing, and working spiritually. Now, uh, there's a, that's all talking about our walk and whether we're walking in the flesh or walking in the spirit. And uh, if we're being productive, mature Christians, it has nothing to do with testing whether we really got saved or not. That's where I want to. Amen. I want to get in the flesh with this guy. I'm telling you. Yep. Oh, boy. Okay. I'll continue on. Let me see. I've had both my hips replaced because my bones are degenerating. You know how they got replaced? I was a missionary. I didn't have a dime. How am I going to get implants? 
How am I going to be operated on? A man in Austin, Texas, Stephen Whitlock III, a young guy, 32 years old, but a brilliant man. He walks into this his Sunday school class one day at a church there in Austin, Texas. He hears people praying about a missionary who can hardly walk up in the Andes Mountains. He goes, give me his name. He called me. He said, come, come to Austin. I'm getting the ticket. I'm getting the doctors. I'm getting everything. Your hips are taken care of. That's what I'm talking about. I was walking through the jungles one time, high jungles in Departamento Amazonas in Peru during the war with the Sendero Luminoso. We were in a place the military wouldn't even go. We were lost, me and another brother, and we were traveling through the night in the darkness. We had smuggled ourselves up there in the back of grain trucks, and we were going to preach in a place because the believers were just depressed and torn apart and didn't know what to do when everyone's making fun of them. We knew we had to go in there. So we- Luke. Would- Yes. I, I just wanted to say he does this, what other people do. They try to bring their experiences in. See, these people and me, I suffered real persecution for my faith. Just because Americans aren't suffering persecution like that doesn't mean they're not saved. Do you see what he's doing here? He's saying, I'm the real deal here because I was willing to risk my life for my faith when I went to those foreign countries. Do you see what he's doing? Yeah, Uh, uh, just think in the entire sermon, how many lines were spoken using I and you. (laughs) He's not talking about Jesus and the grace Uh -uh. of God and the free gift and he did it all. He's Uh -uh. not the gospel. It's Uh -uh. all self-centered. And if anybody's boasting, we're not by works of righteousness, which we, we have done. And, and yep. we conclude a man is not justified by, by works, but by faith. Yep. And, uh, so that no one can boast. See, yet, it makes sense in the natural boasting. mind, though. Man what? loves it. The world, the world loves this kind of preaching because it seems right to man. Makes sense to us. Oh, he's good. He's suffered for his faith. He really loves Jesus. Well, you're not saved because you love Jesus. You're not. I, I'm so sick of this kind of preaching. He sounds an awful lot like the Pharisee at the temple compared to the tax collector. Thank you, God. He's doing, yeah, he's boasting about all the things. I'm glad I'm not like these other people. I'm not real Look Christian. what I do. I'm yeah. willing to suffer for my faith. Thank you, God. I'm not like those people. Yeah, and Jesus said that one. He's not. He's not justified. No, uh-uh. it's the humble tax collector that Jesus said was justified. Okay. It's it's hard. I'm trying to read this so that everybody can understand how he is actually representing himself. Uh, okay. So she, he says, uh, so, so we would get lost and we're going through the jungle. And finally we come upon this village. We walk in there. We don't know where to go. We don't know where to spend the night. We know that the terrorists can be absolutely everywhere. We know we could be a dead man. And Paco walks up to this person out on the streets like almost midnight and he goes, uh, hey, hermanos, uh, por acá, uh, are, are there brothers through, the, through here? And someone said, that old lady over there, an old Nazarene woman. We knock on the door and I said, soy pastor. She grabs both of us, pulls us in, shuts the door behind us, sticks us down in the basement, goes out and kills a chicken, fries up some yucca, everything you can imagine. She's feeding us. She's taking care of us. She's housing us. Could she get in trouble? Yes, she could. And then you say, oh, I'm a Christian because I go to church. You've got to be kidding me. That's love to you. You need a new definition. You say, Brother Paul, you're using satire. Read the prophets. They did the same. Some of this Christianity floating around America is worthy of making fun of, and it ought to be exposed. Do you love the people of God? You know who you, who are you with? Someone asked me, 
how did you know? Young guys always ask me, how did you know that Charo, your wife, was the woman for you? I said, real easy. I, I wanted to be with her. How do you know you loved her? I just wanted to be with her. How do you know you love them? You just want to be with them and talk about Jesus. Talk about Jesus. Do you love? Now let's go on. There's much more here, but we need to continue on. I want to go through another test. Chapter two, me, verse me, 15. Me, 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 you, 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 me, 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 you, you, you. That's all I'm saying. Just like you said, Luke. Yeah. I mean, could you imagine a chat room and to all the congregation, imagine if you were listening to this sermon and then you're examining your life and you hadn't gone out into the jungles like him and he's saying, oh, you haven't done anything near what I've done. So you better uh -huh. examine yourself. You're not even a real Christian. And, yeah, and that's look what he's done. I do. Look how much I love people. Look how much I love Christians. Yeah. How does he know that because they go to church, they're not Christian? Yeah. How does he know in go talking about secular TV and secular music? That has nothing to do with being saved or not. And plus, I don't get condemned over anything. I'm in right standing with God. And God counts that faith as righteousness. You know, blessed is a man who doesn't condemn that which he allows. Those people are getting messed up around eating food offered to idols and stuff. What is an idol? It's nothing. What's music? It's nothing. When you're in, in Christ and you know he saved you, there's a joy and a peace to that. And all I see here is him trying to take real Christians and tell them, stop trusting and resting in Jesus, but look at yourself. Look at yourself compared to me. Are you really a Christian? I mean, look what I did. I, I had to have a hip replacement. And I'm walking in the mountains with no shoes on, living in a box, you know, preaching the gospel to people. I mean, everything is about what he did and what you got to do. It's so frustrating. Yeah. And imagine what if all of us were talking to each other that way and, and, and questioning each other's salvation and comparing how much work that we're doing. You know, I, I like to do that with the Lordship Heretic. Uh, I, I have a video series called The Challenge. I hope you'll you'll watch it. And anytime you encounter a Lordship Heretic, uh, use this technique, but ask him, well, have you completely stopped sinning? And, you know, yeah. they, they'll hem haw around, they'll water down the definition of sin, trying to make mm -hmm. it act like they don't sin. Mm -hmm. And then and then he said, well, what about your works? Well, tell me about your works. What, what works do you do every day? And Almost everybody can hardly even name anything. Was, well, I say my prayer. That's what I'm like saying. That. And if yeah. they really did know us and yeah. saw our lives, they'd see that we live better than most people proclaiming this garbage. It's yes. just not about us and there's no need to boast. Yeah. I don't go telling you what I give people and how I help and what I do. It's none of that. And we yeah. shouldn't. But they always talking about their works that he don't do anything. All yeah. they do is come against the real gospel. If I it's ask a lordship it. heretic, okay, if works are so required, I want to know all the works you do. I'd mean, like to hear about all your works, and they don't. Uh, they don't don't have really have much to say. Well, really. many. But even if they do, start to talk about doing something. I say, oh, oh wait, wait, you're sitting right now. What do you mean? I say, you're boasting about your work. Uh -huh. You're boasting. You're not supposed yep. to boast about your works. That's all Plus, he's doing. He wants who us can to be lay, Who can lay a charge to God's elect? It's God who justifies. Mm -hmm. It's not anybody's place. Uh, I would like hate uh, RL said in the chat room, Luke, he's like, the accuser is Satan. And all I'm hearing Paul Washer do is accuse the brethren. Accuse them of not being saved, of not living their faith enough, of not being genuine. Of not, you know what? They're always saying, like Ray Comer said, do it again, but mean it this time. You know what? Christ meant it when he died on the cross. Mm -hmm. Is that the strength of my faith? It's my uh, the object of our faith. That's where it needs to be put. Yeah. And it's just so sickening. Yeah. It, it's so disgusting to see. And and a person with the Holy Spirit that has some spiritual maturity, this should get under their skin. This kind of preaching. Now, I don't mind somebody preaching hard against sin. I just don't like it as part of salvation or, or proving salvation. 
Because then we get into some confusion and muddying up the waters, you know? Yeah. Because they yeah. say, oh, you love sin. That's why you don't like this preaching. No, I don't like this preaching because it's another gospel. Yeah. And they stand accursed for preaching it. Yeah, it's a damnable heresy. Anybody who believes this is how you get saved by uh, based upon how much you're sacrificing, mm -hmm. uh, they're not saved at all. He's the ones questioning people's salvation. But I say anybody who has faith in their own works is not saved at all the way that he uh, wants everybody to do it. Plus, and what arrogance. Could you imagine, what if this community here, the chat room and others uh, in the congregation, what if that was what we were doing with each other? How Look what I sacrificed. Do, yeah. Look, How long do you want to do when everybody's uh, comparing their works with each other and challenging their, uh, who's done the most? That would not only make me sick, I'm, I'm sure it makes Jesus sick. And ignoring the sacrifice he made, as if something you do could compare to that. How mm -hmm. arrogant to think you got something to bring to the table. Yeah. Okay. Ugh. Let me read on. Uh, uh, now let's go on. There's much more here, but we need to continue on. I, I want to go through another test. Chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. What is the world? Everything in this fallen age that contradicts the attributes and will of God, everything that does not come forth from God and goes back to God in worship, that's the world. You say, well, I love secular music. Uh, let me just share something with you. I don't care. I'm not going there. This is what I'm going to tell you. It doesn't matter to me whether it's secular or Christian. This is my question. What's being said in those words? Because if what's being said in those words contradict the will of God, you're violating his will and you're loving it. And the adults here are probably going, amen. Okay, let's talk about your television. You watch things. You expect God to move. You, you love those. You love their jokes. You, they're off-color jokes, their humor. You find yourself laughing in wickedness. And then you want God to move in your family and move in your life. Do you love the world? My friends, yesterday I was nine years old. Today I'm 43. Tomorrow I will be 90. Life is a vapor. It is fleeting. Everything will die. All will pass away. We are to love the things of God, the things that are eternal. And one of the things of a Christian is that they are not entrapped or enslaved to the things of this present evil age. But How dare are... you laugh, Luke? How dare you have any joy at all? That's carnal. <laughs> yeah not only is, is it is it carnal but uh uh he he he's going to say that there's no such thing as a carnal christian that's coming up okay so don't brace yourself for that okay uh uh i was i was preaching at a university thing about a year and a half ago and i noticed that everyone was seated in it it was about two minutes before it was all to begin. All of a sudden, at a side door in the auditorium, probably a group of 30 or 40 beautiful girls come walking in and just kind of walked down the front there and sat down in all the seats. I mean, it was designed for them to showcase what they were. I looked at all of them and I said, young women, I said, let me give you a little bit of advice. I can see I'm a man. Many of you are very, 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 very beautiful. One day, all of you are going to be terribly, terribly ugly. It's true. To the wind with your money, to the wind with your beauty, to the wind with your wealth, it will not remain. The, one, the only thing that remains is the glories of Christ. Death is a present reality. You say, oh, how do you know? You're not that old. My brother died. My father died in his arms. I preached the funeral of my sister. I know about death, and I know that it come it could come to some of you before I finish snapping these fingers. You say, Brother Paul, you're trying to scare me. You have discerned correctly. Love the world? You love to listen to the very things that nailed your supposed master to the tree. Come off of it, man. Become a hellion. 
give yourself to demons, run wild, but don't come in here saying you're a believer and playing that game. You want to dance with the devil and dance all night long, but don't come in here dancing with Christ for a moment and then kick back there and share your love. We're talking about loyalty. Love the world that nailed Christ to the tree. Many of you, just by professing faith in Christ, you crucify again the Son of God. You need to realize something. This is the Christ. This is the Son of God. This is the Lord of glory. Isn't it amazing? Uh, Luke, that, that verse needs to be addressed. Go ahead. When he says you crucify the Son of God afresh, he's talking about that verse in Hebrews, I'm assuming. But we all know that the reason he's saying that you crucify Christ a second time is because they're not believing on him. They're returning to filthy animals for their blood atonement and they're rejecting the son of God. So it says you are trampling the son of God underfoot, calling the blood of the covenant by which you're saved an unholy thing, despite the spirit of grace. Mm -hmm. So it has nothing to do with how you're living about crucifying him a second time. It's you, for rejecting it. Do you know who's, who's crucifying Christ again? Him. Do you know who that verse actually applies to? Him. Him, he's the one that's yeah. doing it by telling them that's determining whether they're Christians or not. That's, that's right. exactly what Hebrews is saying. That's right. They were, they were requiring religious works. And yep. if you're requiring religious works, you're crucifying Christ again. And yeah, that's exactly and then, what Paul Washer is doing here. So the verse he's using against them, is it should come right back against him. And, and in Hebrews, the very specific thing he's saying is that if you if you if you if he offers the blood of his son, then you go back to animal sacrifices, then you come back to Christ. You're crucifying him a second time, as if the blood wasn't good enough the first time. That's what he's talking about. So he's taking that completely out of context too. Yeah, Hebrews is. I I, I love John, Galatians, and Hebrews. Those are my favorite books in the Bible. But unfortunately, Hebrews happens to be a book that's twisted and misapplied like he's doing it here yep. so badly. But it's, 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 the first chapter tells us who Jesus is better than any other chapter in the Bible. And it's a and great yeah. eternal security book. Ton of tons of eternal security in there, and the verses that they try to use to support lordship salvation are saying exactly what you said. They're saying, "Stop coming back to the temple doing these animal sacrifices. These don't work anymore. They have no place anymore. You're you're not recognizing that what Christ did accomplished everything, and it's finished." Wow. Okay, I'll keep going. Many of you, just by professing faith in Christ, you crucify again the Son of God. You need to realize something. This is the Christ. This is the Son of God. This is the Lord of glory. Isn't it amazing that we're going to have believers from China, believers from northern Nigeria that have died as martyrs, dragged through the desert behind camels, some of them skinned alive, but they would not deny Jesus and here's all these American Christians standing beside them that couldn't even find an, uh, enough of anything inside them to even attend church on Sunday morning. Does anybody have a problem with that? One man can be skinned alive and not deny Christ, and the other denies him in the smallest of things, and yet they're all born again? I think not, my friend, I think not. Do you love the world? Look at verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life, it is not from the Father, but from the world. Sometimes I'll get seminary students and they'll all, they've all got this great idea that they're going to go out and do something for God. So I'll stand before them and I'll say, okay, I want everybody to breathe in. They all breathe in. I say, breathe out. They all breathe out. And I say, theologically, from where did that breath come? They say, from God. Let me stop you here. Uh, this part in verse 16, uh, it, it says, for, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life. He's using the verse against everybody else that he's actually doing. He's boasting about him. 
and and these certain people around the world that are so much better than you stupid lazy horrible fake american christians and he's all he's doing is boasting about uh-huh. that that's the pride of life that the verses talk of it's amazing the verses he's using against them he she needs to look in the mirror by the way when you're talking about the pride of life and all that it started in the garden of eden when adam and eve decided they'd rather have the law the tree of the knowledge of good and evil instead of the tree of life which is christ jesus so the pride of life is actually works of the law is man's works so or like you said that's exactly what he's doing yeah i have not once heard anything about christ dying for our sins about justification about being sealed by the holy spirit about putting your trust about what god did for man how christ through his obedience saved anyone who puts their trust in him all i've heard is how works 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 prove you're saved and mean that you meant business when you gave your life to god yeah I, nothing to do with I, anything. I've, I've said this before and i can't i don't know a better way to make this distinction but religion says do 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 yep. but christianity says done it's done yep. he finished it he accomplished it for us yep but what he's doing is all religion it's do do you're not doing enough you're not a real christian you're not working hard enough and look at what i'm doing it's shameful look at me <laughs> i say okay you can breathe out uh breathe on your own now, what are you going to do for God? The lust of the flesh, the pride of the body. We live today basically in the Roman Empire. Can't you see that? We have around us an empire of flesh and muscle and beauty and hair, and it will all rot in the tomb, rot in the tomb. The wealth and the glamour and the glitter of all the things when people are investing in their lives will all rot, but the one who does the will of God will abide forever sister what's the will of god to believe on he who he said he doesn't even know the most basic concept of christianity what is the will of the father to believe on the son yep i look at my life right now i'm middle-aged and i think sometimes back i think what if i was not a christian what would be my attitude now think about it I'm 43. The days of my strength are over. The days of my beauty, they're over. The days of wonder and dreams about what my life is going to be, they're over. What's left for me? Just to grow older, more tired, and die. And yet, here I am now, a Christian. What does it mean? By God's grace, 22 years have been not been wasted in a meager trifling sort of way maybe but truly in a way they have been given to christ and now the years ahead of me and you know what i'm a boy of god he sounds bitter like he gave up all of his best years for god how dare you have any joy in your youth mine's gone my life's over i'm 43 and it's just over for me so i mean doesn't he sound bitter i just look like every sentence has the word i in it uh -huh. you're not a man of god till you're about 65. i see men of god still alive and those that have gone on before me i listen to those <laughs> old men at 85 and 90 barely I... can stand up in the pulpit and begin to speak in gl just glory all around them and i say lord is that is that what's waiting for me? I hear about the saints that are about to cross over and their eyes fly open and they just cry out, glory, glory, Lord, is that waiting for me? It's going to get better, just going to get better. You say, well, your, um, your, your candle's going to be put out. Yes, my candle's going to be put out only because the sun's coming up. This world is passing away, and I can tell you biblically that if you're living for it, you're an absolute fool. But the one who does the will of God abides forever. 
And for those of you who are young, oh, what a precious opportunity now to serve the Lord, now to serve him. Many that Again, the will of God. Again, Luke, like you just pointed out, he doesn't know what that is. Yeah. He, he really has no clue on the most elemental thing about Christianity. Mm -mm. Uh, many that were called and used mightily of God were called as children in the Bible. Don't you see that? How old was this Samuel when he began to hear the voice of God? You say, oh, I, I must wait. No, you must not wait. Seek him now. Seek him hard. If you seek him hard, he will let himself be found by you. It goes on in verse 9. No man seeketh after God. <laughs> it says no man seeketh after God. Now he says in verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. Yeah, but he doesn't tell you why that is. In 1 John, why were they not of us? They were antichrist. They denied the divinity of Jesus. They denied he's the son of God or they denied the bodily resurrection. They yeah. were denied the father and the son. It says that. Yeah, the, their, their status of being us was not uh, judged by the way he's judging it at all. No, because they, they denied Christ. It, yeah, it's what they believed. They mm -hmm. did not believe correctly. Yeah. See, they like to do this to scare you. Now, this does not mean if someone leaves our church and goes to another that they're not a Christian. That's not what that means. What it's talking about is this. The true Christian who has entered into biblical historical Christianity and then leaves might go into some new stuff, new Christianity, new teachings. They're rampant. They're everywhere. Every wind is offered. Leaves that... Uh, leaves what is known as basic historic Christianity to go follow after some new stuff that has very little to do with scripture and nothing to do with biblical history. They've gone off from us. They've gone out from us. They don't remain in the body or someone who comes in and they might be with the, the group, you know, with the church, with the fellowship, with the congregation for six months or a year. Uh, and then they depart and they stay departed and they don't go for, to another fellowship, what does that mean? They went out from us. And what is it showing? They never were of us. Because once you're in Christianity, you stay in Christianity because he who, who, he who bought you uh, in keeps you in. It wasn't Noah who shut that door behind himself on that boat. It was God. You know, it just, it, he just, this technique he uses there's a lot of what he says that we, we could say amen if he was applying it towards our ministry, our service, living our, li living yeah. our lives. But he's making this all as a test of, of whether you are a Christian or not. So he's misapplying things that are, you know, it's in the Bible. <laughs> the, the, the Bible's true. But well, I, did the, I did the video tonight on the three parts of salvation. We were saved. We were saved from the penalty of death. We're being saved from the power of sin. And we will be saved from the present world and the very existence of sin. So he's taken the second part, which is our progressive experiential uh, growth, and making that part of the foundation of the salvation of the soul. Yeah. It's a mess. Yeah. it's, it's And none of the verses he's used, Luke, not one, have meant what he's using them to say. Exactly. Not one. Right. Of every single verse, uh, it's it, it totally out of context and uh, misapplied, misunderstood, mm -hmm. and misunderstood in the worst possible way. Yep. Okay. I hear so many people that will say, oh, if I just make it to heaven, I'll be secure. If I just make it to heaven, I'll be secure. Knowing that, then where was the devil when he fell? It's not heaven that, that's going to make you secure, my friend. It's being in Christ that makes you secure. It goes on. Another test, verse 22, chapter 2. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? 
This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son, who denies the Son, does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. The true Christian is going to embrace the fullness of the person of Jesus Christ. Now, many of you are saying, yes, that is true. They are going to believe that Jesus is God in the flesh. Yes, that's true. They're going to believe that God became a man, that he was a real man. Yes, that's true. But that's not all it means to embrace the fullness of Christ's person. This silly little stuff going around and receive Jesus as a Savior and not Lord is absolutely absurd. The fullness of his person you believe in, you receive, you embrace all of it. He is Lord and your obedience to the Lordship doesn't make him less or more of Lord. He is Lord, period. And if he saved you, he is your Lord and your Savior. You being obedient to his Lordship has nothing to do with whether he's your Lord or not. If I'm disobedient to my father, does he stop being my father? Of course not. Mm -hmm. That's just ridiculous. That's just turning the camera back on us. See, Jesus is the Lord of all. He's not Lord at all. Nobody uh, listens to the prompting of the Holy Spirit 100% of the time in every area of their life. And since God standards perfection, you better hope you got his grace. Because to say that you can receive him as Savior and not Lord is ridiculous. When he saves you, he is your Lord. And he doesn't stop being your Lord because you're not obedient. He's still Lord. That that's makes all me crazy. That's all, that's all true. <sighs> I want everybody to look at it from a different angle now. Uh, last Sunday, sister, I wish you could have been with us, but last Sunday I had about 30 words and Matthias and I, we gave our definitions of each of these Bible words, these terms. That's this whole study. I hope everybody will watch that if you didn't see it. There's a word that I should have put on the list that is one of the most misapplied words in the Bible, and that is Lord. Yep. It has a capital L. Why is it capitalized? He's divine. Divine. When it's yeah. capitalized, if you go to the, to the uh, Greek, you're going to see that it says kurios. That means not Lord in the respect that you're his servant and he's your master. That means Lord in the respect that he is divine. He is deity. He is God almighty. So believing that Jesus is your Savior, Lord and Savior, it means he's your Savior God, as I always say. Praise Jesus, our great Savior God. I am so sick of people coming on my channel denying his divinity and his eternality. And I'm telling you, Luke, I've put the same four verses up proving he pre-existed and created all things, and they will not answer these verses they just keep coming back with that heresy, and finally I've just blocked them. But I'm glad that you acknowledge that because it does mean that he is divine. He's the name above all names. He is the God, and it has nothing to do with you being like you said. It's not in the context of servant and master, but that he is divine. Yes. That's why when he's talking to Romans, if you confess Jesus as Lord, see, it was a big deal because they had many lords. They had many lords. So Paul's telling these pagans, he must be the God to you. And that was a big deal. People don't, it's not saying confessing him as Lord is in obedience to his lordship. It's saying confessing him as the God above all these false little gods, the Lord over all these false lords. That's what he's saying. And I think it's Romans. Makes me crazy. Yeah. I'm glad you said that. Yes, yeah. So please, everybody, when you see the word Lord in the Bible, don't think that you have to give your will over to God and submit your life and surrender and pick up your cross and follow him. It means you must worship him. He is God. That's what it means when it says Lord. So don't, don't let the Lordship heretics misuse that word and put you into slavery. Okay. Now, the true Christian is going to embrace the fullness of the person of Jesus Christ. Now, many of you are saying, oh, I read that already. Jesus is Savior. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is prophet. Jesus is priest and king. Jesus is the only prophet who ever walked on this earth. 
Jesus is the only king. Jesus is the only true priest. Jesus is, again, the only true wise man. Let me ask you, do you believe that? All right, how much are you going to his word to find his wisdom? Do you believe he's king? How much are you going to, uh, to his word to find his law? Do you believe he's prophet and he knows about your latter days? Then how much are you going to the word to settle those latter days through your own obedience? Now, finally, look at verse 29 of chapter 2. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of God. Now, what is righteousness? Everything that conforms. Everything that conforms to the nature and law of God. Do you practice righteousness? If we were to look at your life, are you practicing God's law? Are you practicing God's wisdom, God's word, God's precepts? Are you? Is it a practice in your life or are you departing from it? Does it have nothing to do, absolutely nothing to do with you? Now, it goes on to Matthew 7. So he's out of 1 John now. In Matthew 7, Jesus says, Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That's one of the most terrifying statements in the Bible for American Christianity because basically what he's saying is this. Depart from me, those of you who claim to be my disciples, and yet you lived as though I never gave you nope. a law to obey. No, nope. no. Nope. And it doesn't say practice lawlessness in the King James. It's worker of iniquity because they relied on their stupid works. They boasted about what they did for Jesus. And he said, you didn't do the will of the father, which Luke, you already mentioned was to believe on the son. So they never trusted Christ. They thought their good works was gonna get them into heaven. Look at all we did for you. We preached, we cast out demons, we did many wonderful works in your name. And he's gonna say, depart from me. He never knew them, why? Because they never trusted in him. And so their works are iniquity. Their works are unequal with God's righteousness. And so they are practicers of lawlessness because all of the sin they ever had is still on their account because they never had the blood atonement. They never received it by faith, period. And they twist it when it's talking about them, Luke. Yeah. You said that earlier. It's ironic they use these verses, but it's talking about people like him who are trusting in their own goodness, their yeah. own faithfulness. If anybody listening now is not aware of this, this is so important for you to understand because that portion of scriptures, the whole thing, the context, I'm going to paraphrase it, but Jesus is saying there's going to come a day when people will come to me and he's talking about the day of judgment. And he says, people are going to come to me and say, Lord, Lord, look at all the wonderful works that we did in your name. And we did this and we did that and so on and so on and boasting about all the works that they did. And Jesus says, workers of iniquity, in other words, your works are filthy rags. That's what the Bible says. That's what God thinks of our works. If we ever go to the judgment and present our works to God, the way that Paul Washer is saying here, and the way that the, the, Jesus is describing the judgment, if you go to the judgment and offer your works to God, your filthy rags, he's going to say, worker of iniquity, your works are iniquity. Yeah, but Paul Washer thinks it means you're not living without enough. Okay, where is the standard? How much of sin... Uh, are you practicing to be not known by Jesus? He didn't say, I knew you and I lost you. I never knew you. So it's yeah. not that they got saved and then they fell into sin. Your sin was dealt with on the cross. So if all my sins paid for and I've received him, he does know me. He lives in me. So there's no way my sin can separate me from him because it's all, I've already been reconciled to him through the blood. So these people just didn't trust in the blood of Christ. But Paul Washer is saying that they didn't live good enough as Christians. They weren't serious enough about their faith and they're going to be rejected by Jesus because they're not good enough. And that's the exact opposite of what the gospel message is. It's the exact opposite. And I, it shows the spiritual blindness 
if anybody can look at this verse and not see that these people are clearly relying on their works. Now, if they lived in a bunch of sin, I think these were very righteous people according to the world, Luke. Why else would they be boasting about what they did for God? They were living the righteous life, weren't they? This is exactly the same as that Pharisee that before the temple. Yep. They keep doing exactly the same thing. Yep. And Jesus said, not to him, depart from me. I never knew you. He's saying that that man's not justified. The other right. one, the humble man that was not bad bragging about his works. He's the one that's justified. So and if guarantee Paul Washer's not tithing 10% of his herb garden. What? I know Paul Washer's not... Uh, tithing 10% of his herb garden like that Pharisee was. Yeah. Ridiculous. Right. Okay. Uh, let me see. Uh, let me see. Uh, do, you, uh, do you practice righteousness? If we were to look at your life, are you practicing God's law? Are you practicing God's wisdom, God's word, God's precepts? Are you? Is it a practice in your life? Are you, or are you departing from it? See how he's saying departing from it is because Jesus says depart from me. I mean, the way he twists every word is just sickening. Does it have nothing That's to true. do? Absolutely nothing to do with you? Yeah, right. It has nothing to do with you. It, it, that's it. He doesn't have a clue. In Matthew 7, Jesus, uh, Jesus says, Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That's one of the most terrifying statements in the Bible for American Christianity because basically what he's saying is this. Depart from me, those of you who claim to be my disciples, and yet you lived as though I never gave you a law to obey. I just described most of what, what's called the church in America today. I'm a disciple. That What's your relationship to his word? I know him. What's your relationship to his word? Are you seeking to know his wisdom, his precepts, his commands, and to practice them? Is it a part of your life? Now, let me tell you something. Something. I think legalism is death. Oh, God. What a... Yeah. Talk about contradiction. Unbelievable. All he's doing is talking legalism. It's all legalism. All of it. To say that. He says, I think legalism is death. Let me tell you that. I think it is. I think it's death. But I want to tell you something. The Bible tells us wh what we can think about and what we cannot think about. Do you know those commands? And are you practicing them? He says he uh, he hates legalism. And then he's asking if you're being legalistic. Yeah. And then he tells you, what are you watching on TV? What are you thinking about? What? No, Paul tells us to think on that, which is good to think and do things that edify and lift up the church. But that has nothing to do with being saved at all. The Bible tells us what we ought to watch and what we should not watch. Do you know those commands? Do you care? Are you practicing them? The Bible tells us, now listen to me. The Bible tells us what we can wear and not wear. You say, oh boy, here he goes. No, listen to me. I'm not talking about defining every last crossing, every T, dotting every I, that you can't wear this. It is telling us this. Whatever you put on your body better be decent. It better be decent. And it ought to enhance the beauty God's already given you. I Brother look Luke, I'm sorry. Do you know what most of the things about wearing what you wear on your body is about? It's about the wealthy boasting their wealth in a church. Women shouldn't be wearing pearls and adorning themselves with gold and expensive things, flaunting their wealth in the church because it, it often makes people treat them differently. Like James talks about being a respecter of persons. So it's more about women covering themselves and being, you know, uh, discreet and also flaunting wealth. It's all about that. They never talk about that, though. That's the only thing about uh, clothes wearing that's really a big deal. And presenting yourself as an opposite sex. Those are the those are the things that are talked about. But it there it has nothing to do with what he's talking about. Yeah. I and, and again talk about I hate legalism, but now he's telling you what to wear. 
you know? How does that make sense? Uh, I, I, I wish the audience, instead of being crushed and demoralized the way that they responded to it, I wish they could see through it the way we can see through it. So it's so sad what he, he did to them. He says, uh, the, the, the Bible tells us, now listen, the Bible tells us what we can wear and not wear. Oh, I'm sorry, I covered that already. Uh, w- one thing about a communist country, the communists come in Eastern Europe filled with all those little brick roads and beautiful little stone houses and everything. The communists come in and tear it all down, put in pavement and these ugly concrete blocks and make everybody, they take beauty and destroy it. Look at fashion today. Look at it. It's not conformed to the will of God. God wants his people to be beautiful. It's a God that also means modest and decent. But he... But beautiful people, what does what? But what do we see? Grunge, dressed in black, hanging over like this. I mean, it's unbelievable. You know, in a way, I think it's really, really good because I mean, a man who's godly no longer will have much temptation. The girls are trying to look as ugly as possible. I mean, that's not what God wants. I gotta stop him. I gotta stop him. He's talking about. God wants his people to be beautiful. What did the Bible say about Jesus? He had no form or comeliness about him. He had nothing physically that would have been attractive to man. So this is crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let me, uh, let me just, I I, I know I'm kind of, I, I, I don't have much time to preach to you. So I'm going to use a shotgun approach here. Girls and guys. Let me give you a thing that my wife uses, and it's really, really good. It's this. If your clothing is a frame for your face, it's of God. If your clothing brings attention to your face from which the glory of God should be shining, it's of God. If your clothing is a frame for your body, it is sensual, and God hates it. Now, I know they're kind of pretty broad guidelines, but there they are. It doesn't mean you are... Uh, you have to dress like a Puritan and put buckles on your shoes or anything like that. But those are the guidelines right there. Righteousness. And why am I saying this? Because the Bible touches every aspect of our lives. There's something in there for every area of our life. And what we need to do is discover what that is and conform our lives to it. And you say, oh, what a burden. You're lost. Because the Bible says the commandments of God for a Christian are not a burden. They're a joy. They're a joy. Verse 3 of chapter 3. I'm going to say something on this once you read this paragraph. Everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. You want to say it before? Yeah, okay. I just want to say the hope he's talking about is obviously... The hope of Jesus's return and what Paul's saying here, it's not evidence of your salvation. He's saying if you're keeping your eyes on Jesus and you're anxious for him to come back, you do purify yourself. Why? Because your heart's pure. It is focused on Christ. It's not thinking of things on the world because it's constantly looking for Christ. That's all it means. I I just wanted to say that. Amen. Okay. Uh, now look at this. What is it talking about? Oh, well, Paul Washer is not the one to tell us what anything's talking about. <laughs> he says the hope for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Well, he right so far. Everybody now reading these Left Behind books. The only thing left behind in the Left Behind series was the Bible. But everybody's excited. You know, I believe in the second coming. I believe Jesus is going to come. I believe in all this stuff. Okay, we'll see whether you believe it or not, because it says in verse 3, everyone who has this hope, what does he do? Purifies himself just as he is pure. Now, here's something, Christian. It's just going to blow your mind. You know we are told to purify ourselves, and some of you guys need to hear this who are really, really theological. Not only has God sanctified us in Christ, He calls us to strive to be holy. He calls us to purify ourselves. Let me ask you a question. 
Could I sit down with you right now and you talk to me? We're all alone. You talk to me about the ways in which you are seeking to purify yourself. Can you? Going into the book of Hebrews, could you sit down with me right now and we open, could open it up and I say, just share with me how this affects your life. Could you sit down with me right now and explain to me the ways in which you're striving after holiness? Who, who's that striving? What? It's God. God does all this. He's yeah. the one that makes us worthy. What? And Hebrews, Hebrews is talking to the Jews about not returning to Levitical law. What, what is he talking about? And, and it's all what you're doing, what you're doing, what you're doing. I'm just, uh, well, what, what he's doing is he's butchering the book of Hebrews, the way all the Lordship heretics butchered the book of Hebrews. He oh. says, uh, do you see, do you see? This, this Bible is not poetry. It's not just little maxims that are cute. It is your life. It is your life. Everyone who has this hope that hopes in him. How do we know that he really, that we really hope in him? Because we're seeking to make ourselves pure. We're seeking, aren't we already pure? We, we are sanctified. We're declared holy. We're, um, that was my words, not his. Sorry. We're seeking. We're striving after holiness. We're striving after holiness. We really are. Are you striving after holiness? My mom, she's almost 77, and she's raised most of us kids by herself because my dad died. Tough lady. She's a Croatian. Her parents came over through Ellis Island. She went through the Depression. She's a tough lady. She's from Detroit. It makes her mean. She'll sit there sometimes. I'll be over there. I'll go over to her house, pass by there before I go to the office in the morning. She'll be over, over the word. I'll look up at her and she'll just be broken. She was saved when she was 10. She'll look up at me with tears in her eyes and say, I am just so unholy. I am just, I just found, look at this verse. God's telling me my mouth, my tongue, and I spoke out a turn the other night. I've got... I've got to go back and ask my sister to forgive me. I'm sorry. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. And we're supposed to stand fast in the liberty where Christ has made us free and be not again entangled in the yoke of bondage. Why? It, this sounds like Catholicism. This, this fear and torment and guilt. And, oh, you know what? When you're guilty like that, you're right where you're supposed to be. The law made you guilty. Good for you. Now turn to Christ in faith. Be reconciled to God through the death, burial, and resurrection of his son. And get peace. Knowing you have peace with God. And it with full assurance of faith. Isn't that what um, Hebrews says? To be in full assurance of faith. Not looking to ourselves. Not looking to our dead works. But to his. This woman's falling apart because she misspoke something to her sister and she's going, she's so unholy. We're all as an unclean thing. And that's what we need to acknowledge that we're lost. So we turn to Christ and we get peace and joy and forgiveness. I see nothing but torment and religious guilt and works and bondage in this sermon. I mean, how could anybody leave church having been lifted up or edified by any of this nonsense yeah nothing is biblical what a miserable state of existence oh. to, to live like that oh. you know we, we say that uh, uh christianity is, it's not a sin issue it's a sun issue yep and I, I made a video let's stay focused on jesus and we always talk about if we're just focused on jesus we're not focused on sin that's right so, we don't have time to sin. We don't even think about sin and, and all this, yep. these, these things. If, if we're preoccupied with Jesus and the yep. saints. That's and, right. But they, they want you to just be broken and crushed and crying all the time as, as a sign that you, you're really Christian. Um, she says, sometimes I don't even think I'm saved. Oh, see? What a horrible state. I said, Mom, this is the evidence that you are. All these years of walking with Christ and yet still there, striving to be holy. Yes, resting in the finished work of Christ. Yes, but striving to be holy, to be righteous. Everyone who has this hope is going to do that. 
Well, that's the first time he said reading and talking uh, that he ever used the phrase resting in the finished work of Christ. And yet he's saying, don't rest in it. <laughs> yep. yep, don't. Yeah. Make sure you're guilty and shaking and fearful and always look into yourself to make sure you're saved. Because, well, you know, the Calvinism is most of it. <laughs> they look to their own perseverance instead of God's We're preservation. We're getting near the end, everybody. So uh, we're trying to try to finish this night, but we're getting close. It's, he says, now he says in verse four, everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness and sin is lawlessness. That's verse four, sister. Uh, yeah. What does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. He's trying to show you how horrible sin is because we really don't get it. I love what Watson says in A Body of Divinity. He's always saying this. He goes, you have not sinned against an inferior prince. You've not sinned against a small mirror from a small village. You have sinned against the Lord of glory and the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You know, uh, you know not what you've done. Well, let me say, this is Brother Luke saying now, yeah, that's fine to tell people about their condition before they get saved. They recognize the seriousness, but then tell them, sins paid for. Jump for joy. Jesus paid yep. for all your sins. This what yep. a horrible offense against God we've all done. But Jesus paid for it all. That's what he should be saying. Yep. Hey, Luke, we still got like four pages and it's 11 and I got to get my boy. Okay. I don't all know right. if we're going to, are we going to be able to finish it? Uh. Well, okay. Let me see. We got through what? Uh, oh, we only did like six or six. No, let me learn on page nine. And yeah, I don't want to rush through this last part. Yeah, the last part, especially when he starts talking about carnal Christians. We don't yeah. want to rush through that. Okay, let's uh, finish this up now. And let me see. Let me put the mark where, uh, remember where we are here. Write this down. We are on... Uh, Verse page four. 17. Page 17. Okay, yeah. Next time when we finish this up, we can go through it more carefully and at that portion and have time to interact with the chat room more yeah. and uh, discuss the whole thing in, in, in retrospect. But for now, do you have enough time that we can look at the chat room and see what anybody Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's go through that and see. Anybody, uh, we're going to be finishing up here over the next couple, few minutes. So uh, if there's any questions or thoughts that you'd like for us to address before we finish for the night, please start posting them now for us. Uh, I'm going to go through all the chat room comments uh, probably tomorrow and just to see every, what everybody had to say. And I'll, I'll RL made a good point about being perfected in love. Those that are in that kind of fear, they have not been perfected in the love of Christ. They still feel condemnation. See, it says there is no more condemnation for those in Christ Jesus who walk after, not after the flesh, but after the spirit. But they think that's something they're doing. But Paul says, no, you're not in the flesh, meaning you're not a carnal, natural man. You're not in Adam. You're in the spirit because you've been born of God. This is not our actions. And so Paul Washer saying there is still condemnation. He's saying there is condemnation. Now there, there's consequences for carnality on this earth because we're saved unto good works and that's our purpose. But that's not, it has nothing to do with our eternal standing or our positional standing. Our behaviors have nothing to do with our positional standing in Christ. It's yeah. rather we receive the, the atonement, the blood payment for our sin debt. That's what makes our positional place uh, reconciled to God. Yeah. But well, he's got it all wrong. Yeah, he, he, he is uh, basing everything on misunderstanding. Maybe, I don't know if it's misunderstanding. I don't know his true motives here. But... He either misunderstands or is purposely misapplying the concept of examine yourself, whether you be in the faith, and saying the examination is examining your works. Right. And your changed life. Right. And, and then every, the way he interprets all the other verses it is in a manner to support that premise. Right. And that's 
that's the horrible concept that he's using for this whole sermon. So the whole foundation's wrong. And hi, Celine. She wanted me to give her a shout out. Yeah. Hi, Celine Fredema. Yeah, hi, Celine and everybody else. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, he says, he, he, he said that uh, uh, this is really the point that I think it shows you that the stupidity. He says, yes, resting in the finished work of Christ. Yes, but, but guess what? There's a saying. That when you're talking and you make a point and then you say, but you've canceled out everything before the, but. So he's saying, yes, we rest in the finished work of Christ. But in other words, forget about resting in the finished work of Christ. That doesn't, that doesn't, that's not true. That's what he's really doing. Oh, uh, um, yeah. This is really making me uh, upset and angry, much worse than Jonathan Edwards even. And, yeah. uh, and, uh, Where's Charles Spurgeon when we need him? <laughs> I know. That, the, and, and, and they unfortunately twist Spurgeon's words a lot to prop up yeah. their false doctrine. But th this right here would, would keep anybody lost. You couldn't save one person with this sermon. You Not would only. take somebody up. If they were already saved, they'd question their salvation because everybody knows they fall short. And that's where we're supposed to be. We're supposed to see ourselves as unrighteous, sinful, and lost so that we turn to Christ so that we know we are perfected in him and that we're reconciled to God through him. But He, there's no salvation message in this at all. And if they were lost, they'd run because they think, well, God's got these standards so high, I can't even dress right or watch movies or listen to music. I'm not coming to Jesus because he's going to make me into a jerk. Yeah. And if he could just give them the gospel and let the spirit work in them, it, they could be saved. But he's not. He's preaching religion. So the saved would be scared they're not saved and they'd be confused. And then the unsaved would be running from God, scared that he's demanding things of them in order to get the free gift. Yeah. Let me respond to, to Hendrix. He says, do you really need to review all of... Uh uh, uh washer sermon i think you guys suffered enough and did a pretty good job slamming this crap <laughs> well, Hendrix, you know i'm pretty fed up and disgusted <laughs> and to, you know uh, i'm about at my limit but i want to get through it all especially because he does talk about there's no such thing as a carnal christian and that's yeah. something we need to really address so we will finish it next time we'll We'll pace ourselves so that we can get through the, the remainder of it in the in the two the ninety minutes that we allow for this uh, program. Yeah, because that's the uh, home run section, Luke. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, everybody in the chat room, uh, uh, as I said, I'll go through the chat comments uh, tomorrow as I and see what everybody said. But I appreciate you being there. And uh, uh, Sister Renee, uh, what's your last words before we say good night? I'm coming. Hold on. I stepped away for just a second. I listened to you, though. Okay, hold on. Thank you guys for being here. I love you. And thanks, Luke, for letting us finish that last section where we can take time on it. Because uh, this section on the carnality really needs to be addressed. And I know you'll have a lot of examples in Scripture where what he's saying is absolutely refuted. Mm -hmm. So, um yeah, I can't wait till we move on to another another sermon. <laughs> Maybe we can find a good one this time. When I close the program, hang on just for a minute. I want to ask you something, okay? Okay. All right. Okay, saints. Uh, thank you all. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.